Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event. My name is Cami Tusi, and I lead the Maimonides Society, the Jewish student organization at Harvard Medical and Dental School. Today's panel, The Unspeakable Terror, Gender-Based Violence on October 7th, is co-sponsored by the Maimonides Society, the Harvard Jewish Law Students Association, and the Harvard Business School Jewish Students Association. Today, we gather with a profound sense of respect to hear from voices that are vital in our collective fight against gender-based violence. We extend our deepest gratitude to each of the panelists for your courage in sharing your voices and to our audience joining from all over the world. As the moderator for today's event, we are honored to have Professor Elizabeth Goffberg, the Associate Professor of Medicine and Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Professor Goffberg, please. Thank you, Cami, and thanks also to all the student organizers. It's an honor to serve as, as the moderator today. In this event, we will hear experts discussing the gender-based violence perpetrated by Hamas and its terror attacks on Israel on October 7, 2023. We will hear the oral testimonies of witnesses, first responders, and others who have documented these crimes. There will be no images or video screened in this event, but the testimonies will include graphic descriptions. Those who do not wish to hear these graphic descriptions are advised not to watch further. We will learn about the medical and treatment aspects of gender-based violence, as well as the legal aspects and the response of international organizations. I now have the privilege of introducing our esteemed panelists who bring perspectives from healthcare, law, advocacy, and policymaking. Dr. Devorah Bauman, is the director of the Bat Ami Center for Victims of Sexual Abuse and the head of pediatric and adolescent gynecology at the Hadassah Hebrew University Medical Center in Jerusalem. She's also the past chair of the Israeli Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology and a board member of the International Federation of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology. Dr. Bauman developed the first pediatric and adolescent gynecology training center in the Middle East. Dr. Kohav el Kaim Levy of the Hebrew University International Relations Department is an expert on international law, human rights, and feminist theory. She holds an SJD from the University of Pennsylvania uh, Carey Law School and is the founding head of the Devorah Institute for Gender and Sustainability Studies. She established and chairs a newly formed commission called the Civil Commission on October 7th Crimes by Hamas Against Women and Children. This commission is an independent, non-governmental collaboration of international human rights experts and women's rights organizations. The commission was created to advocate for and support the investigation of war crimes committed by Hamas against women and children, both during the October 7th massacre, as well as the continuous war crimes towards those that were abducted. She served as legal counsel for the Human Rights Division under the Deputy Attorney General of Israel, and recently authored Israel's groundbreaking national report on gender mainstreaming during emergencies for the National Security Council at the Prime Minister's office. Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari is the founding director of the Rackman Center for the Advancement of the Status of Women. She served 12 years on the UN Committee on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and is a co-editor of the recently released CEDAW commentary by Oxford University Press. She has served as an expert witness in multiple international tribunals and served for five years as national chair of the advisory committee to the Authority for the Advancement of Women at the Prime Minister's Office. She was awarded the International Award for Cur Women of Courage by the U.S. State Department. Orit Salizianu is the executive director of the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel which is the leading NGO in Israel working for the eradication of sexual violence. She previously served as head of communications at Hebrew University, where she is also the chair of the Gender Equality Committee. She has also served as a spokesperson for the Israel Women's Network, Israel's leading women's advocacy group, and is a member of the committee to establish a national program against sexual harassment in Israel. Thank you all for agreeing to participate in our panel discussion. I just wanna to mention to the audience that I may refer to gender-based violence by the acronym GBV. I'd like to first turn to Devorah. 
Could you please start us off with the general background on the role of gender-based violence in war and terror? Thank you so much. I feel really privileged to uh, participate in this very important webinar. So if you don't mind, I would like to start with the general um, sexual violence, and then we'll go deeper, like zoom in. Uh, so at the first, I would like to uh, clarify the definition of sexual violence. Sexual violence means any sexual act uh, done without the consent of the second part, of the other part, okay? And we have many definitions which uh, I will try to, you know, to make, uh, to, to define. So the first is sexual harassment. That means, again, sexual act or obsessive sexual act uh, without any physical involvement. Sexual um, assault is the same, but with uh, physical involvement, when the extreme of this involvement is the rape, which is penetrative vaginal intercourse or a sodomy, which we call for the anal sex. And of course, we have the sexual abuse for children, and it's always called the abuse, especially for young children, because it's kind of abuse of their innocence because they don't really understand what's going on and then don't understand that it's wrong. Many, many times they don't even understand it's wrong. So about the, the <clears throat> sorry, the frequency, we're talking about every one in three women and every one in six men. And even if we look to the medical reports of uh, American a association of gynecologists and a, a, a obstetricians, a, according to the survey done for adult women, they had between 12 to 40 percent of sexual uh, uh, assault during childhood or adolescence. And again, one point that has to be very clear, sexual abuse or harassment or, a, or assault is not an act of love, of good feelings, of uh, caring about the other side. It's an act of uh, humiliation. It's an act of brutality, a egocentric selfishness, and mainly saying, in other words, I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about your thoughts. It's me who has to decide what to do. And that's in general. And now we come to the gender-based uh, violence in war. So it's for centuries, centuries and more that it is a part of a war. And even if we look before uh, the Christian era, 2000 uh, or 1000 years before, we have the Trojan War. And then the Trojan War, after the Greeks, they were, weren't Greeks, but later on they were Greeks, they win the battle, still uh, their advisor, the commander, said to the soldiers, I'll read it, none of you will say to Hari and return to his home before he has laid one of the women from the women of Troy. Means that even though they win the, the battle, still the, the last accord should be raping women of the enemy. And uh, we have a lot of explanations why it's so important. And of course, it's humiliation. And a woman is a symbol of safeness, of uh, somebody who keeps the home when he is in the battle. And uh, hurting the woman means that uh, nothing is any more safe. And also, I know it's it's an older an uh, um, older idea, but still, women are those who are getting the continuity of the nation. Once you rule out the, the woman, you exclude this nation. There is no any more nation. It's the nation of the ruler. And that's what things, that's what are uh, the people who concur the, the, the battle things. And if we look even more in Zoom to 7th October pogrom, or any, or massacre or whatever you decide. So we have um, evidence that Hamas, you know, that according to every religion, you are not allowed to hurt children, 
and women and old people. So we have evidence that the Hamas got the permission. They received a religious permission from their uh, rulers, from their uh, you know leaders to abuse women and their bodies in this massacre in order to instill fear, fear in the Israeli population. So that's where we go. Thank you, Devorah. And now I'll turn to Kochav. Can you please tell us why you established the Civil Commission on October 7th crimes by Hamas against women and children? Yes, of course. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for hosting this event. Um, and I'll read from my notes uh, because it's a, such an important uh, event. So I want to begin on a personal note, uh, sharing that uh, I wish uh, we all didn't have to be here. I find myself deeply saddened just thinking about this new task we've been given to testify to the atrocities that took place here in Israel. Um, I know thousands of people in Israel and around the world are, are listening to us. And so this morning, while preparing to for this event and to my speech, I decided to first start with a little uh, gesture that my uh, grandmother taught me uh, to do before a significant moment in my life. And I just, uh, um, to light a candle, and I prayed. Uh, I prayed that I will have the strength to speak on behalf of the vic victims and to do them justice. I pray that I will not fail them in any way, and I prayed for those babies, children, women, and men still held hostage. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we established the commission on the eighth day of the war, as more and more evidence of gruesome crimes against women and children emerged. Myself, like many of my peers at the commission, felt we need to take action. Footage of videos broadcasted by Hamas on social media in real time during October 7th showed clear violations of international law and brutal crimes committed against women and children. To our deep surprise, despite uh, what we already knew, no international, almost no international recognition or condemnation specific uh, to the crimes committed against women and children was published. Therefore, we took it upon ourselves to call for recognition and action. We also realized that those crimes must be documented and brought to the attention of the international community. The Commission has already reached out with information to numerous relevant international bodies. 160 experts and many women's rights organizations have joined the appeals. Thousands of women have signed a civil petition, and additionally and equally important, the Commission has move on, moved on together and create credible data uh, database that will translate into several reports to ensure that the October 7th victims of sexual and other violence against women are never forgotten and their story are adequately told. Another important aspect of our work is to provide guidance to Israeli authorities regarding the gender-based violence aspect of the investigation, including on trauma-based, uh, trauma-informed in uh, investigation, response to survivors, and on gathering testimonies on war crimes against women. So it's been a very, uh, very busy few weeks, very busy and difficult few weeks. Yes, uh, it, it's only been about 36 days since the brutal attacks on of October 7th, and investigators are still uncovering and documenting the many atrocities that took place. Uh, could you, Khahav, please summarize what we know so far from police investigations, as well as from the testimonies of survivors, eyewitnesses, medical examiners, first responders, and from Hamas terrorists who were captured on October 7th? Yes. So over the past few weeks, we've received numerous horrifying testimonies of brutal gender-based war crimes and crimes against humanity. Hamas raided more than 20 villages, towns, and small communities. In just a few hours, it attacked thousands of women and girls, mothers with their babies, infants, young girls and boys, as well as elderly women, all who faced really unimaginable horrors. Innocent civilians were violently tortured, raped, mutilated, burned alive, slaughtered, or abducted. Jews, Christians, Muslim, foreign nationals, including migrant workers and foreign students, are all among the victims. 
In addition, some 20, 240 Israelis and foreign nationals, including women, children, and babies, were brutally dragged into Gaza. They are now being held hostage by Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. Their condition is unknown. Requests by the ICRC to visit them and assess uh, their conditions were denied. So the evidence of the magnitude and the brutality emerged as early as the morning of Saturday, uh, of October 7th, as Hamas proudly uh, posted live images and videos of the attack on social media. Um, some, I, um, some were even sent to the families of the victims uh, using the victims' own phones. There is a wide variety of sources of evidence of sexual violence and horrific gender-based crimes. Among them, videos from survivors, eyewitnesses, first responders, testimonies, new reports, testimonies from investigations of captured terrorists, forensic evidence from hospital morgues and the crime scenes. So sadly, we understand that the vast majority of victims of rape and other sexual assaults of, on October 7th, including genital mutilation, were murdered and will never be able to testify to what uh, has been done to them. The Israeli police has announced last week that the events of October 7th have resulted in the largest criminal investigation of gender-based crime in the country's history. The details of the police investigations have mostly not yet been uh, released to the public. It should be emphasized that we predict that it will take many more months and maybe years until all relevant information is collected. We also have to be mindful together to the fact that due to the nature of gender-based crimes, uh, some witnesses or, or victims may find uh, the courage to tell their stories only years later. I will now read some of uh, the accounts co collected so far. So um, I need to warn you, the information is extremely graphic and can be traumatizing. Uh, it is for each one of you to decide if this is suitable for you. If you feel the need, please seek counsel, as this could be a difficult burden to deal with alone. We ourselves uh, are dealing with it as well. If you have any doubt whether you want to hear these accounts, please mute the Zoom for the next few minutes. Videos and footage released by Hamas show, for example, um, a dead woman uh, which is seen, who is seen is in one of the videos at the festival with rigor mortis, stripped from the waist down, down, legs spread apart, body partly burned. Another image shows the body of a young woman stripped from the waist down, her underwear torn, hung on one leg, and she was photographed uh, on the site at the Nova Music Festival. A video released by Hamas shows a young woman who was abducted to Gaza, surrounded by men in the back of, uh, of a car, her hands tied behind, uh, tied behind her back, and a large blood stain between her legs and signs of trauma on her feet and arms. Another video posted by Hamas on social media shows the body of a young woman almost fully naked and unconscious, her legs in an unnatural position, and she is paraded in the back of a pickup truck while the crowd cheers. Another image shows a murdered woman, her hands bound, her body abused and burned. Another particularly horrifying video shows um, it's very difficult. So again, uh, I want to warn you of this specific uh, horrifying uh, evidence uh, video that we have. Um, shows Sarah torturing a pregnant woman while she is still alive. They cut her stomach open, take out her fetus, and cut off her breast while they're, while they, while they're beating her. First hand testimony of the high witness uh, of the of an eyewitness survivor reported by the police. From a testimony collected from a survivor by the police, I'm reading from the from the testimony. They bent her over and I realized they were raping her one by one. Then she was passed over to another man in uniform. She was alive when she was raped. She was on her feet and bleeding from her back. He pulled her hair, he shot her in the head while he was still raping her. Didn't even lift his pants. They cut her breast and literally played with it on the street. 
they held up someone's head as a show of strength, like a, a woman walking with a bag. Moving on, survivor uh, of the Nova Festival witnessed uh, from their hiding places. God, a survivor of the Nova Festival, told GTA News, for two hours I'm hiding and hearing people getting kidnapped and women getting raped. And without end, you hear people dying, begging for their lives, women begging for their lives. And you can't make a sound because they'll find you. They'll find you to kidnap and kill you too. Another survivor told Tablet Magazine, women have been raped at the area of the rave next to their friends' bodies, dead bodies. Several of these rape victims appear to have been later executed. Others were taken to Gaza. Hila Fakilero, a survivor of the Nova Festival told Sky News, I saw a, videos of, a video of my friend online that is naked and the terrorist is sitting on her and raping her. I will not say what else he did. Another survivor testimony from one of the communities is, giving, is given by a 94-year-old grandmother. In the video, she cries that her grandma, granddaughter was abused and murder, murdered right in front of her eyes. The grandmother is asking, why was she spared? Why her young grandchild slaughtered? Testimony of a female soldier. Lieutenant Tamar Ben Shimon, who, sur uh, who survived the attack at the Ares military base, has testified that the Hamas men tried to take her clothes off and others stopped him and they left the room in which he was hiding. This was reported by The Guardian. I'll move to reports from first responders. A, a paramedic who entered one of the houses in Kibbutz Be'eri reported in a video published in several media outlets, I saw two girls lying there. One, uh, on, one on a bed, one on the floor, in their bedroom. And the girl, a 14 to 15 years old teenager, she is lying on the floor on her stomach, her pants are pulled down, and she is half naked. naked. Her legs are spread, spread out, wide open, and there are remains of sperm on her back. Someone executed her right after he brutally raped her. She was left there to lie in a puddle of blood. In one image, a woman's body is seen naked, shackled to a mattress with metal wire, along with a man's body also tied with metal wire. wire. Itzik a senior volunteer of Zaka, uh, reported the case in, the, in details through Reuters. You can see definitely that, she, that the woman uh, underwent rape. She was naked, face down, and her clothes and, uh, had clearly been taken off, not by her. This is a woman who underwent went rape. Moving on, medical and morgue staff report. M medical and morgue staff report severe injury, injuries cruelly inflicted. They confirm specific brutalities against women and girls, in including evidence of widespread torture and rape on the bodies found. Sherry, an Israeli volunteer from Jerusalem who was working to identify the bodies of female victims and prepare them for burial, told the, the Daily Mail. We have seen that women have been raped. Children through elderly women have been raped. Forcible entry to the point where bones were broken. Again, uh, this is a very hard testimony. Please, if, uh, if you need, please mute the Zoom. We saw many mutilated corpses. We saw genitals cut off, heads cut off. This was just abject cruelty. Women have been raped. They're, they've been raped so violently that pelvises were broken. Now think about what it must take to break a pelvis or their legs were broken. There were, were forced, there was forced entry. This is babies up until grandmothers. Rabbi Chaim Weisberg, who also worked uh, with identifying the bodies, said, we see evidence of torture and savagery. We have babies with their heads cut off, bodies without hands, without legs, without genitals. Moving on, testimonies from investigation of Hamas terrorists. When, I, uh, when asked, why did you take women? One terrorist answered, to have our way with them, to dirty them, to rape them. And why take the kids and babies to rape them, he answered. Another Hamas terrorist was asked, what were the plans for the abducted women? He answers, I'm telling you to whore them, rape them, hurt them, and interrogate, interrogate them. 
whatever they feel like doing, they rape them, attack them. When asked if, uh, if that included the babies that Hamas took captive, the men responded that Hamas raped them, abducted them, attacked them, killed them. Another Hamas terrorist confirmed that the actions included beheading people and having sex with dead bodies, including including young women. According to Ma'ariv newspaper, the terrorist said that he received permission from his religious leaders to uh, to murder children so that the children would not grow up as Jews. He also received permission to abuse women and their bodies in order to spread fear in the Israeli society. Stopping here, never in my, my life uh, would I imagine that I would be standing in front of my academic peers to talk about gender-based war crimes and crimes against humanity committed against Israeli women and girls in such a, a large scale, and we expect much more to come up in the future. Despite years of progress in the recognition of gender-based violence against women internationally, and the fact Hamas footage was available on, online for anyone to watch already on the 7th of October, the international community has failed women yet again by not speaking out about these crimes and recognizing they have happened. This is not an isolated event um, in history against women. To quote uh, McKinnon, who wrote in connection to the Bosnian case, like all rapes, these rapes are particular as well as generic, and their particularity should matter. Every woman and every soul is an entire universe on its own. What we've seen in Israel were rape and gender-based crimes under clear orders and under full control. It was rape unto death, rape as massacre, rape as crimes, rape, uh, rape uh, made to kill and torture women crimes against humanity, using them and their babies as an instrument to force exile of those communities in Israel. It was rape to be seen and heard. Women's and girls' body used as, uh, as trophies for victory. As McKinnon clearly articulated, this is rape as genocide. Thank you for your courage, Kochav, in collecting these horrific testimonies. Uh, it is so crucial that you share them with us and, and with the world. Uh, I'll turn to Orit now. Uh, given what we just heard, what types of care should be made available to victims of gender-based violence? And when should it be made available? And if you could share a bit about what services are offered by the Israeli Rape Crisis Centers. Thank you. Uh, before it's very hard to talk after hearing uh, what Kochav just said. Uh, my heart is beating, and I have to say that. And uh, before ad answering your question, uh, I, I want to share something personal about me. Uh, I'm a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. My mother was a ten-year-old girl when World War II began. Uh, when I grew up. And I don't know if people in the, around the world remember that, but my mom, my, my mother had a tattooed number here on her arm, if you can see. She used to put a plaster on her tattoo. So as a child, and even as a grown up, for me, it was the most trivial thing to have a mother with a tattooed number and a plaster covering it. Why did she cover the plaster? Because she was ashamed. She was embarrassed. And this is how I grew up. Today, and after, and after knowing what we know that happened in this 7th of October program massacre, I and all of my colleagues, I do not want to live in a world where these kind of horrors are erased. These kind of crimes are concealed and that people will be ashamed and embarrassed because of the atrocities they suffered. And I will do everything that I can do to prevent this kind of denial, the erasure, erasure of he heinous war crimes against women, against mankind. This is now what we are hearing from the world, and this is unbearable. Um, over a month has passed since this massacre, and we still do not know what has happened. Uh, I, I am uh, the head of the, the association of all nine rape crisis centers in Israel. Uh, uh, in a, in a, and we already got uh, uh, information about, uh, uh, except for what Kochav said about these crimes. I do not think that there is a Western democracy that has experienced such a massacre in the last decades. 
and such cruel, sadistic, and, and inhumane. And we will never forget that, and, and we will never, never forgive. And now, if uh, to answer your question, uh, how how do we help and can, how can we help women? And I must say, also men. There are also men who suffered. And the, as the rape crisis centers, we help all women and men. How can we help them when it's uh, to deal with these horrible things? Uh, it is it's important to say and to explain that rape this rape crimes during war times have unique and additional characteristics compared to rape in normal times. But I also, I must say that there is no hierarchy of pain and suffering. Rape is rape, crime is crime, violence and violence, and all of these create immense trauma. I want to tell you that uh, characteristics of rape during war, uh, war, uh, war time have, uh, are as follows. First of all, they're life-threatening because these crimes were committed by armed terrorists against unarmed women and children. Many of those who were raped were murdered and only their bodies are now the living testimony. And those who survived uh, uh, experienced rape in this life-threatening danger. Uh, there is always under-reporting in uh, sexual uh, violence, but in these war crimes, we, 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 we know that there will be extreme under-reporting because everyone, first of all, in Israel now is in a collective trauma. We are in a war, uh, and the, nobody has regular life. In order to talk and to report, you have to have some kind of relaxation. But no, there are people deported from their houses, their missiles, maybe in the middle of this uh, webinar, I will have to run because there will be some missiles flying uh, towards Tel Aviv where I'm living right now. So the underreporting will be very big. Also, many of these war crimes are characterized by group rape, group rape gang rape. Uh, the estimates in the literature are that about 90% of wartime rape cases involve group rape because uh, and, uh, many soldiers do it together because for them it's some kind of bonding and solidarity and whatever. This kind of rape is also uh, characterized because it's in front of an audience and we also heard some testimonies near family members, spouses, and other participants, participants, such as also other people who are in the Nova party. Uh, this kind of rape of a partner or a family member is intended to widen the torture to the observers who remain powerless or, uh, or receive also their own tortures while trying to prevent it. In the current era, and this is what Kohav also told us, and the extent of the, the social media networks, um, the, there is distribution of videos and, and acts of horror to show other people, to show the families what has happened. And the, the last characteristic I want to talk about is the brutality. Rape during war times often comes with practices of sadism, hatred, and dehumanization. The dehumanization occurs when the victimized woman is facing the terrorist, but she is not considered as a human being, but as a symbolic body to which hatred and violence are directed. This brutality is also expressed in physical injuries accompanying that soul. Okay, so how do we deal with that and what are the con uh, psychological consequences? This kind of sexual violence during war times is experienced by, uh, by the immense loss of control over the body. It's similar to other sexual assaults, but it's also uh, uh, characterized by losing the basic sense of security and control in all areas of life. You should imagine how uh, that you live in your house, suddenly, out of the blue, the door is opened in a huge surprise and terrorists are inside. I do not know if any uh, if any of the people around the world who are denying or not believing what has happened could, could even imagine this kind of horrific thing. The impact can result in general angsty, sleep disturbances, flashbacks, nightmares, depression, and even wanting to commit suicide. What do we do and uh, what should the Israel uh, society and the, the Israel government do after 
after, which is now, now is after. One of the central principles is the involvement of the survivors in all of the stages of the treatment. We have to develop, because we have never suffered such a thing, special treatment frameworks that will, will be based on the understanding of the needs of the survivors. And also there should be an awareness of the specific social cultural characteristics. Intervention must be based on the victim's voices tailored to their needs and the unique context, as well as integra integrated and coordinated with the existing service system. Uh, we have to, uh, during the, the, develop the development of the service, it's, it's essential to consider sensitivity to the, to the unique reality of the victim, the survivor, understanding that therapeutic work is done during the times of instability, and it will take time to, 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 to gain back control. Of course, we ha have to understand special gender and control, cal cultural co uh, characteristics. And the main, main thing is to regain, let the survivor have control in the uh, treatment and uh, in the treatment. We, at the Association of Rape Crisis Centers, we have nine uh, rape crisis centers around the country. We give a 24 seven, uh, assistance day and night. Only in Yom Kippur, we do not work. It's all, of course, free of charge. The basic principle of our work as part of dealing with trauma is the restoration of control. We are, in fact, the triage rooms for sexual assault. Our hotline receives calls all day and all night. The volunteers listen to what the survivor wants, accompanies them through their legal process, assists them in the hospital, and helps them in various bureaucratic matters, even helping uh, helping with academic studies, everything which is needed. We believe, we fight for them, and we give validity to what they want and what they went through. We're always believers. We're never doubters. We never ask for details. We never seek evidence. We're not police. We are here to, to help. Uh, the encounter with us, uh, in, encounter with the rape, rape crisis centers really gives a lot of strength and healing power. There is nothing more meaningful than receiving validation, regaining control, and meeting also other women who have been through this kind of ordeal. Thank you, Orit. Uh, could you briefly um, comment on... Uh, the situations in which victims of sexual violence who survive are often in the position of deciding whether or not to report what happened to them. Is there uh, anything else you would like to say about the emotions and considerations that these individuals might struggle with when making the decision about whether or not to report? This is a very good question and a very relevant question. And I have to tell you also that me, myself, from the beginning of the massacre, the war, I'm getting uh, phone calls from from all over the world and from all over Israel about details and wanting these reports. I have to say something about that. Everybody should know and everybody who deals with sexual trauma knows it. It is very, very difficult to talk and report about sexual assault. You know, I can tell you even the basic experience, even when I volunteered on the hotline, we answer the phone, sometimes quiet, nobody speaks, close the phone. Sometimes we wait wait and suddenly the voice comes out it's gradual it takes time it's so hard to talk about it you know it's it's you have to it's something very very shameful many times for the survivor because uh because uh there's a, an immense embarrassment a feeling of gu guilt maybe it's my fault maybe in this massacre i didn't run fast enough maybe i did not hide well enough maybe i should have fought him back and this guilt is paralyzing uh maybe now time maybe we should uh just uh go on to um devora who might expand on your comments from a medical perspective a as a physician can you share what type of medical care should be made available to the victims of gbb and, and please speak to the particular challenges faced by hostages who were raped, uh, covering the, you know, both medical and psychological and other challenges posed by the prolonged captivity and the lack of access to any form of, of care. 
Okay, so just to uh, make it clear that I'm also the head of uh, rape, rape crisis, crisis um, uh, care center, but it is inside the hospital and the people who are taking care there, they are most not only physicians, I'll explain you, it's also open 24 on 7, it's very close to emergency room, the name as you said in the beginning in our center is Batami, which means in Hebrew, the daughter of my uh, people, uh, a bit problem because I always do with students discussing this issue and one of the students told me listen this is a name for girls but boys are raped as well so maybe you change the name but anyway so we are one of 11 uh, centers all over israel we are serving about 1 million of residents here in jerusalem area and um, we are open even on yom kippur uh, we have a multidisciplinary team which is uh, consisted of psycho uh, psychotherapist or social worker and a doctor and a nurse. All of them are qualified for taking care of sexual abuse people. And uh, as Ori said, uh, we know that the people are full of shame, full of guilty, and they usually the minority is coming. According to the researchers, they show that only 80% of abused or assaulted women and men, men even less, are coming to hospitals or to welfare um, centers and etc. Most of them, more than 80% are not coming to any authority. And we know that in children, it's even worse, it, it's terrible. In children, less than 50% of children will tell somebody about what happened to them till the, the adult health life. Uh, so once they come, we are acute rape center, means that we take care of people who had the assault up to seven days. And why seven days? Because up to seven days, we have a lot of efficiency of our treatment. Our treatment is, of course, starts with the social worker that is, makes the support, the psychosocial, and exactly what Orit said to, you know, to, to, to decrease the guilty feeling, to say that once it was without your consent, it's assault, it's sexual assault, even though never mind how it, what was your dressing? Never mind what you said. Never mind what you didn't. It is assault. And especially very important is that uh, we have involvement of alcohol and drugs is about 40% in our center. Uh, those who are coming, the victims are coming, they are, have about 40. And many of them have the feeling of, uh, you know, of guilty that if they wouldn't drink, or be intoxicated, maybe they could, uh, you know, uh, they, they, it wouldn't happen. And it's very important to tell them that if I told before that you need a consent for sexual act, and if you don't have the consent, then it's sexual uh, assault or rape, then we know that the people who are intoxicated, they cannot give any uh, consent. So again, it was done to a person that couldn't give the consent, like young children by us, it's for example, the age of 14, age below, and I think in more countries, like people with special needs and et cetera. So yeah. once, sorry. Maybe just finish your, your sentence and then we'll, we'll move on. There's so much uh, uh, to okay. share. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll make it few sentences because it's very important. So in our center, the purpose besides the psychological support is to prevent un unwanted pregnancies, to prevent sexual transmitted infection and to collect forensic data for uh, forensic um, uh, evidence. And it's very uh, time limited. It means for example, to prevent HIV AIDS, it's only 72 hours. After that, you cannot prevent, you can treat, but not prevent. And uh, about pregnancy, it's only 120 hours, five days. So just a few sentences to switch to the, um, to the war and to the 7th October. 
So usually we see those people, the victims, and according again to the data, 40 of them, 40% of them have sad, what we call extra genital uh, injuries, which usually are small hematomas, small press scratching, or etc. Now, when we talk about the people who are taking hostages, who are abducted, they have terrible extra genital um, uh, uh, injuries, and they have terrible genital uh, injuries. Because I'm uh, in this uh, sexual violence about 20 years and the head of this center almost 10 years, I never see a woman that was abused or assaulted and she has pelvic broken her pelvic bones. I had never heard I have never seen, I'm sure, oh no. it should be, again, graphic pictures, it should be something terrible, something extremely aggressive and violent. Uh, so I'm sure that once uh, they will be released, and I hope that uh, we will have to deal with many other things besides pregnancies, 5% become pregnant. During the the, we'll have to deal with sexual transmitted infection. About twenty five to thirty uh, percent are infected by sexual transmitted infection. But besides that, we'll have to treat terrible injuries we had never known. And maybe the last word, if you don't mind, is that uh, we have uh, we don't know anything about them, as Orit said. And we don't really, we are now working on this uh, kind of approach because from one side, psychiatrist, and you are a psychiatrist, tell us, don't talk and don't ask them about sexual abuse uh, because they have some kind of defenses and you can broke their defenses and they will just broke down. And on the other side, we have to ask them, at least something. So I propose for the hospitals. I'm part of the hospitals who are going to uh, to uh, get uh, to uh, be ready for those hostages. I propose that we will perform, for example, to all of the hostages pregnancy test. We are going to take a lot of tests. So maybe that's a good idea just to take it. And you know, we are not sure we're going to say them or to tell them in the beginning. In the but just to, 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 because if they are pregnant, everybody knows that termination of pregnancy and should be termination of pregnancy is much more seriously affects a person when it's done in the late stages of pregnancy. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, I'll turn to Ruth now. Uh, Ruth, we heard the historic account of the use of rape in war earlier. Could you please describe uh, the history of the response to gender-based violence and rape in war by the international human rights and legal community, including the UN? And can you please share how this contrasts with their response following the October 7th mass massacre? So first of all, I also want to thank you for organizing this extremely important uh, event. I'll. I'll tell a little bit about the history of how international law came to recognize gender-based violence in uh, conflict-related sexual violence as a war crime, because it's, it's really very, very important to realize that even though, as we heard from, from Dvora and, and, and we know that uh, this horrible practice of using uh, women and women's bodies as a weapon of war and women's bodies symbolizing the body of the nation. So once the woman is violated, then the whole nation of the enemy is violated. There was actually no recognition of this in international law and until the very, very late of the 20th century. Uh, even the international tribunals that were established post-World War II, the Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials, they did not include rape as a separate war crime in itself. And it was only in the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 that there was the first mention of the obligation of states in times of war to protect women from forced prostitution or rape. But the real major step forward was in the 90s following the wars in Yugoslavia and in Rwanda. And we have to emphasize that this was in fact 
very much thanks to feminist critique and Kochav in her uh, introductory remarks mentioned Catherine McKinnon who had a huge role in, in advancing this recognition. So only in those special tribunals, both of them, both the, the special international criminal tribunals that were established to bring to justice those perpetrators of the war crimes, they, they, that was the first time that they included charges of systemic rape as a crime against humanity and as a means for ethnic cleansing. And then finally, in the Rome Statute of 1998, which established the International Criminal Court, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about the International Criminal Court later, it, 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 and it's regarded as the codex of, of international criminal law, sexual crimes are defined as war crimes and as crimes against humanity. Now, that's with international humanitarian law or, or law of war and international criminal law. Then there's the whole body of United Nations, the, the peacekeeping function, which operates countless mechanisms, sets norms for what states must do in different contexts, including during times of conflict. And here, it was once again, the same phenomena. It, the, the first time ever that the United Nations Security Council actually devoted uh, discussion for women uh, a, 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 in themselves was in 2000. They devoted two days of discussion and they adopted the uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 and then a number of subsequent resolutions which formed what we know now as the Women, Peace and Security Framework. First time ever recognizing the fact that even though women have very little say, if at all, in, in starting war, they and children, women and children, are those who suffer the most. They are the most vulnerable, and they have unique, unique attributes of, of sufferings, just like what we have witnessed now in uh, the October 7th uh, massacre. And I'll just mention another resolution, 1820, which particularly recognizes sexual violence as a weapon and tactic of war. It notes that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute a war crime, crime against humanity, or even a constitutive act with respect to genocide. And that's what we, a number of us, already on Monday, the following two days after October 7th, we already emailed and wrote to a number of United Nations mechanisms, the CEDAW committee for which I was a member uh, uh, before, um, to UN women, to UN uh, special mandate holders, special rapporteurs. We, we wrote and we described the actions. And later on, we had hundreds of uh, international law experts and gender experts also under the um, uh, commission which uh, uh, Kochav uh, uh, chairs, we sent all these letters and we specifically wrote that these acts that were committed on October 7th, they fall under this category of all these laws and, and rules that I just delineated, and they actually constitute genocide because they were perpetrated in premeditation in a planned manner, they systemically targeted women and children in the most horrific and cruel uh, manner. Thank you, uh, Ruth. And can you say a little bit more about uh, why have numerous prominent international women's rights organizations and GBV victims rights organization have stayed silent following following the October 7th attacks? I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with describing how the UN mechanisms uh, work. Um, based on my uh, experience, I, I, know how they, I know how they debate, how they function, specifically these uh, treaty bodies, the committees that oversee the implementation of the various human rights uh, conventions. Um, they always have to, uh, or their mode of practice is, is trying to achieve consensus. So once there are members in those expert committees who object to a specific text or a specific way of phrasing things, 
um, let's say statements, because what we are talking about now is those shameful statements that CEDA adopted or the CRC, that's the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And then there's UN Women, which I'll mention um, uh, 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 shortly. Anyway, these statements, they always have to be adopted in consensus. And what, what these bodies adopted um, throughout the past years is always to use this kind of symmetry between the suffering of uh, the two two part two sides uh, of the the of the, the the two parties of the conflict, and that's what we that's what we have seen ever since October seven. So let's take UN Women, which is the political organ of uh, United Nations uh, overseeing all the functions uh, for um, uh, allegedly protecting uh, women throughout the world. Uh, already in the very first statement of October 13, it signaled the direction of this symmetry condemning the escalating violence uh, of the conflict and expressing concern for the suffering of civilians, both in Israel and in Gaza. But what is really striking is the complete, complete silence about the actual atrocities committed during October 7. They failed to name Hamas. They did not mention war crimes, crimes against humanity, and no word about sexual violence committed against women and girls. They did mention the hostages. That's for their credit, at least during their first statement. But that actually was not repeated afterwards in the following statements of UN Women or the head of uh, UN Women, uh, Sima Bauhaus. Now the CEDA committee, the committee that oversees the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which I've referred to as my previous committee, they did not even mention the hostages. And this is really mind blowing. And, and again, I, I knew it would be difficult to get them to issue a statement, a reasonable statement, but never did I imagine that when faced with such undeniable atrocities, the very purpose for which they have been established to, 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 to protect women from these kinds of atrocities, to prevent them, I never imagined that they would actually resort to not acknowledging that at all. And, and by, by turning a blind eye to, to this October 7th massacre and to the unprecedented, the premeditated extreme cruelty of the sexual violence that was committed by Hamas, these bodies, they do not only fail us, Israeli Jewish women, but they undermine the purpose for which they were established. And in fact, they undermine the whole human rights, international human rights system. And this I say with much pain because I, I was, I want to think of myself as still am a believer in this system, but what we are witnessing now since October 7, is a huge, huge blow to, to this belief. Thank you, Ruth. It's really striking how the case of October 7th uh, contrasts with the ways that these bodies reacted in, in other similar situations. Um, Kochav, can uh, you describe the role of the UN human rights system and specifically the international mechanisms that are relevant to women's rights in times of conflict? Yes, so uh, Ruth has already uh, explained a lot. Uh, so I'll just add a few um, like framings of these uh, issues. So I want to first explain that the role of uh, the United Nations, the human rights system, especially in relations to women's rights during conflict is really uh, crucial. It's multifaceted. It typically involves uh, a series of uh, actions following atrocity. And uh, what we wanna see initially is recognition. Uh, reporting of the atrocities. This includes documenting the location, time, magnitude, and specific details of the events. Uh, such very initial recognition is essential for creating, uh, and the commutation is essential for creating a historical record and for any future legal uh, or humanitarian response. 
Second, um, following this, UN agency often UN agencies often publicly condemn the crimes. This is what we really. I'm, I feel like I'm stating the, the obvious, expressing solidarity with the victims and the affected countries. So I want to say that this step is vital for drawing global attention to the situation and rallying international support. And what we see now is that it really prevents these very initial uh, things from happening. So third, uh, the initial responses serve as a call for action. Uh, for other agencies, pro uh, agencies prompting them to provide support and assistance to civil society and humanitarian organizations on the ground. Um, this collaborative effort is really critical in addressing the immediate needs of survivors and in, in implementing preventive uh, measures to avoid further harm. Um, what else? I wanted to say this is where a specific mechanism, like uh, Ruth mentioned, relevant to women's rights, such as UN Women and the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, really play a significant role. Unfortunately, especially with respect to women's rights organization, uh, UN Women and CEDAW have uh, remained silent failing to even recognize the crimes uh, women were facing. And I won't specify all the relevant articles, resolution, commitments made uh, by the international com community, but I must point out that in light of what we've seen here in Israel, I, I feel personally that international law loses meaning. Um, I, I feel as uh, Ruth says uh, said that uh, I, I don't wanna, um, feel that I'm losing belief in, in my own uh, values. I teach generations of students of the importance of the international human rights system, of, of global standards, of international standards. I uh, assist civil society organizations here in Israel to implement these, these standards. And what they are feeling now, um, this failure to recognize this, the atrocities is just failing them and failing every woman here in Israel. And I want to say that the failure to condemn these acts, it really undermines the legitimacy of, the, of global in institutions and allows for further violations, not just in Israel, but globally. And it's also failing our efforts here in Israel to implement, to further implement uh, international standards after the atrocities. Um, so I want to say it has left thousands of survivors behind. Furthermore, uh, I think the weak, if any, response at all by uh, the international community provides a fertile ground for the continuing weaponization of women's and girls' bodies in warfare, as we've witnessed in the imaginal, in unimaginable scale, as I detailed, uh, on October 7th. And um, just a few days ago, uh, I gave a speech uh, before members of the CEDAW committee and uh, I raised the question, uh, are Israeli women and girls protected under international law? Is there international law for them? So this is my uh, take on this issue. Thank you. Um, the next question is probably uh, best directed to Arit and Zavora. Uh, it's, it's important to release all the hostages held by Hamas can you please comment specifically on the importance of releasing the girls and women who are subject to brutal acts of GBV and are still being held by, held hostage by Hamas? Okay, uh, I will. Uh, uh, everyone should remember that there are girls, uh, uh, young women, uh, older women now captivated uh, in Gaza. These these women and also men, I have to say, but they ha need urgent treatment, and it's reasonable to assume that they're not receiving anything. Anything, I'm think I'm thinking about their souls. Their souls are numb. Their pain is unbearable, and they are now also in danger, existential danger. The consequences all of of all of this is are really severe. Every day that passes. Every minute that passes makes their suffering more immense and the, the damage more tremendous. They have to be released right now, immediately yesterday. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, any other comments on that? Um, so just to continue uh, what Ruth and Koha had said, uh, I'm talking about physicians in, all, in the world. 
and I'm talking about obstetricians and gynecologists all over the world that are responsible for the care of women. We don't, their statement are not talking about hostages. They are not talking about the severe illness they are going to, uh, to go through. We have to remember that Again, when we are talking about the brutality and aggressiveness of their rape, for example, we saw, we, uh, Kohav told us, we didn't see, but uh, we, uh, there is a woman that was shown in a picture bleeding heavily uh, on her trusses. And she is probably, uh, again, sorry for the plastic uh, description, but she is probably has a lot of thirst in her vagina. And as doctors, and there are many medical students, we know that a big tear in vagina can be ended with exotivination and death. And very, very quickly, if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't, uh, uh, repair it. And again, the fractures of bone. So we uh, have to release those are the most vulnerable. We have to release everybody. But the most vulnerable are especially the adolescent, female adolescents, the girls and the women, uh, because you have to remember that even when you uh, work with those people, when you give them the help, they are still their mortality rate means they die four times more than the population who doesn't go through rape. They have much more surgery. They have much more pregnancy complications. They have much more heart attack. And we are not involved now in their treatment and they are more than one month. So I don't know whom we are going to see once they will be released. Thank you. Um Soon we're going to turn uh, to the questions and answers that are submitted by the audience members. We already have uh, many coming in, but I just want to make sure that uh, all the panelists um, have a chance to say anything further that they would like to add to the discussion. So if I can go um, first, and I'd like to add that specifically with respect to hostages, you were just mentioning the, the hostages, the fact that these bodies do not, they fail to mention the ongoing war crime of holding the hostages, they actually legitimize disappearance of people and the taking of hostages. And not only at the present situation, but possibly encouraging these reprehensible acts in the future. And I also want to, to, to add that their silent, their failure to acknowledge what actually took place on October 7 adds fuel to the propaganda, to the campaign of denial in which we find ourselves now. Uh, Orit started by saying that she's second generation I'm also second generation. My parents, now deceased, went through the Holocaust. And I could never, never understand how Holocaust denial could actually take place. And what we are now experiencing is a denial of the most atrocious events that took place only a month ago and were filmed in real time and broadcast in real time. And yet we know that the Hamas is now engaging in a campaign of denial. The New York Times just released uh, uh, um, a research showing that they are assisted by China, by Russia, by Iran. And the fact that a third of youngsters in, 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 in North America now actually say that whatever we say, all those horrible testimonies that, that Kohav read out at the beginning of, of this webinar, that all this is fake, that all this is an invention of, of, of Israel, this is beyond comprehension. And I'm sorry to say that international human rights community and international women's organizations are only assisting in this campaign of denial. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, I just want to add to that. Uh, I 
I agree uh, with every word that um, that it's really uh, it's not only that Hamas is denying these inient, uh, inient crimes. We as Israelis really feel, as uh, Ruth said, we are all subject of collective international denial. Um, as I said, the evidence is undeniable, yet we find ourse ourselves fighting a dual battle, one against these atrocities and another one against global silence. And we see really the same um, mechanism of denials uh, of denial that we uh, recognize from individual rape uh, rapes are now um, being um, being showed collectively. So and and just if I had to summarize it all uh, in one sentence, it would be to believe all women as promised, and really international organizations must show and stand for unconditional humanity. Thank you. Thank Any you. other comments before we move to the Q and A? Uh, I would again uh, connect to the medical uh, societies and especially the International Red Cross. International Red Cross is it, its existence is for giving aid or and medical assistance for people like hostages and war in the war conflicts. And if the hostages that are so wounded, our hostages that are so wounded, so sick, so ill, if they don't get this Red Cross uh, aid, who has to get it? I don't believe there are many people in war conflicts that are more uh, injured, more sick, and and more um, problematic than those hostages. Thank you. I want to add one more sentence. I think uh, what Kochav said, I, I, it really, I really feel that you know, on a daily basis. As I said in the beginning, I get calls from all over the world, from journalists, uh, like I assume like my colleagues and from institutions inside Israel. Everybody wants for me the same thing. They want the story. They want. They think it's like me too, that the, the woman will come and say, yes, I was gang raped by Hamas and I will tell you the story. And I feel sometimes very angry. What they say, if I don't have a story that, like that, my editor... You know, I'm talking about everywhere, big, big journals all over the world they won't believe because everything is fake. But, you know, we all know how it is. No, it's not me too, me too right now. It's not the important actors of Hollywood saying me too. I was uh, sexually harassed. Nobody. It, it will take decades. And I want to tell you, I started with the Holocaust. I want to finish with the Holocaust. As an Israeli, we in Israel all, all know that it took decades for men and women who suffered from sexual violence in the Holocaust to talk about it. Only in about the last decade, decade in Israel, the stories started to come out. Only 60 years of silence. So excuse me, everybody in the world, what do you think? What, what, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for the, the survivors to speak up? No, they will not. They have to, to it will take them a lot of time till they can live again and, and 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 maybe maybe one day tell the story but the story happened it happened and there's the reverse proof of burden it happened because the horrible atrocities happened and this also happened and the world must believe and the people who are who do not believe are part of this denial and they're part of the legitimacy of this terrorism and they will suffer from that also because if this horrible terrorism happened in israel it will happen in other countries in the world thank you arit I just want to say, scrolling through these uh, questions uh, on the chat, uh, it's just there are so many expressions of of gratitude for the four of you. Uh, just thanking you for um, this urgently and uh, important and and courageous well, well, all your work, but for sharing this with us uh, today. So um, one uh, question that kind of repeats itself is uh, several times, is uh, what can we, all of us, uh, do as a community to help uh, raise awareness and to support your work? Anyone? It's for any of you. So I'll, I'll start. 
there are many, many initiatives coming from Israel, and they should be accompanied by our sister organizations um, in the world, and not only Jewish women's organizations, but all those who understand where truth is, where courage is, what must be done. Many, many initiatives to reach out to these organizations, whether it is the formal UN organizations, or whether it is all those international, big international women's organizations or women's leaders, celebrities, some were courageous enough to step up, but most actually really adhered to the total betrayal of the international uh, left community in the world. And maybe it's time to mention what's going on in uh, United States uh, campuses. And we know the direct link between what's going on now in those campuses and the money coming from Arab countries, from the Emirates, from Qatar, from Saudi Arabia. So people must be courageous enough and to stand against this denial and to support us in all these um, uh, petitions, all these letters that we keep sending and, and add their voices, add their names, write up ads, never, never forget to mention the hostages. This is an unprecedented situation. Having baby as a hostage, this had never happened before. You know, people keep comparing and, and they rightfully compare to the atrocities of ISIS, but what we went through is to many, many extent worse than ISIS. It was very concentrated, thank goodness, thank goodness. We do have the IDF, it took several hours, too long, but, but it, it finished. It didn't got, go on for, for, for months and months, but during those hours, what went on in Israel, is far worse than ISIS and the hostage situation is unprecedented. So we need all the support of all of you, write to your senators, write to your congressmen, influence your leadership, get more countries to actually designate Hamas as a terror organization. We need to start the process of the international community Israel must not be here in this war alone against Hamas. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, uh, other uh, suggestions for uh, how this community and the world community can, can help uh, in your efforts? So I, I'll, I'll just say very quickly that um, as uh, Ruth said, um, you can uh, echo our words here. Uh, but I, I just, I lived in the United States for five years and uh, I have many friends there and I'm actually, I want to say, stay safe. Anyone who feels safe uh, can echo this campaign, but um, I'm actually worried. So I want you to say um, only if you can raise your voice and you don't feel it's a threat to you, uh, do it. So thank you. Thank you. I think that's what we are doing now. It's a part of changing the world. This kind of webinar, which is I all the time having WhatsApp messages from people that are begging to get in because it's full and they cannot beg in. Probably we are more than 1,000. So people want to hear us. I mean, they don't, uh, if, if they wouldn't, you know, uh, care about it, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't try to get to this webinar. So maybe more webinars, maybe webinars in Europe, in other cities, in other places. Uh, I think that will change. And as for me, I'm, uh, I have another rule as Besides the physician, I'm all the time writing to all organization, medical organization, and mainly gynecological organization, trying to explain what happened, because I think they, they don't know. Thanks, Devora. Just to uh, highlight your point, about 20 minutes before this webinar started, we already had 2,300 people signed up and there, there is a limit to the number here and it, it, it just you know, really emphasizes the need for this. Uh, maybe I want to add one more thing about, about the, about just, what just about the, the registration. 
just about the registration, maybe we should mention that it was recorded and uh, the organizers said that they were going to send it to all those who registered and could not get in. Absolutely, we will do that. I wanted to say one, one thing. We see in the Israeli news what's going on in the States and other European countries about the photographs of the, the hostages uh, thrown away. I do. I think uh, again, as Kohav said, you have to first of all say stay safe. And I, I'm also worried for my friends or in in the United States and other places in the world. But each person who takes this photograph takes a photograph of a baby and dumps it is actually dumping a human being. And really, I cannot understand that. And this thing should be talked about. This is human human to be a human being. Really, a baby. In Gaza, not 10, already 10 months old. How can somebody in the world think it's okay? Thank there you. is a younger baby. We have the, uh, evidence, again, not very based, of a woman in the night, in the end of the night month, took it as a hostage and she gave birth. So we have a hostage of a baby of about one month. Yeah. Thank you. I I, uh, I just want to mention that we're going to uh, go on for about another 10 or 15 minutes with questions, and then we'll um, give all of you a chance to have uh, any last word that you would like to. This next question is both about um, sort of uh, some of the medical aspects, but also about human nature. And uh, I'll just read it. As a doctor, one of the hardest Parts for me to understand is how could these terrorists physiologically be able to rape someone and cause so much terror? How were they able to function? Uh, I read uh, they were on drugs, which is something that I think many of us has, have heard. And this part is about humanity. Even with drugs, how can someone do such an act that is not human? Somebody who is not human. That's it. Physiologically, as Orit already mentioned, we are talking about groups. It's multiple sexual violence. So, you know, they just do it one after the other. And we saw there, there are a, a pictures of and evidence of that. So physiologically, it's, it's possible. But even on drugs, you know, in Hebrew, we have a proverb that when you are uh, toxicated by alcohol, you uh, you can show yourself even if you are good men or bad men so even one who is really a, a, with high level of alcohol and he is not aggressive he will never do such a thing yeah thank you um another question uh two of the speakers have mentioned male survivors victims uh is there evidence so far of sexual violence against men against men committed by hamas during October 7th terrorist attack? And is the system in Israel prepared to respond to the needs of male survivors? I can tell you, and, and if Kohav has more things to add, we have some information uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, male, I don't know if they're survivors, maybe they're not alive anymore, that they're, they're, they were mutilated, if this is the correct word, they're, the intimate organs were mutilated and maybe they were killed afterwards. I, I also heard, uh, I mean, I don't want to go to details. It's too, it's too horrible. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, and, and I saw also one photo, photograph of a, a, a male who, I don't know. I don't want to, to talk about what I saw. Uh, in Israel, there is a lot of knowledge, and Dr. Dora Bauman, uh, she knows that, and she's part of it, uh, how to treat also males who suffer from sexual violence, and uh, as uh, rape crisis centers, and as organizations, uh, and we as the Association of Rape Crisis Centers, we, we uh, were part of a coalition, how to make the Israeli, uh, 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 how, how to make the Israeli, um, uh, uh, the Israeli uh, 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 medical and therapeutic uh, mechanisms uh, fitted to deal with trauma and sexual trauma. And today there's a big community in Israel of doctors and therapists who really know this, uh, this, uh, this, this, have this knowledge and we treat men and women because statistics about sexual violence uh, 
we know the numbers, uh, more women suffer than men, but it's the statistics are very bad and many males suffer from sexual violence. And in the war also, in this war also, again, we will never, never know the real truth. We will never, it will take a lot of time, but we have to take into account that it happened. Thank you. I will just say, uh, just add, um, I will not specify uh, the, the, the image as well, but I, we also saw a very terrible image of uh, a naked man, um, but I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, uh, I, oh, go on. Wanna, yeah, it's okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we, in my center, we did a survey for, we have 11% of the victims coming to our center are men. And we did a survey asking them, would they prefer a male doctor or a female? And most of them prefer a female doctor. So that's how we are not trying to apply now for the hostages that uh, if we talk about sexual harassment and we, we you know, we start the, the whole story, we will ask them always if they prefer a female doctor, for example, like me, to, uh, to make an examination uh, for sexual uh, assault. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. Uh, if, if someone can please uh, say more about the evidence that you have about Hamas ordering rape as a weapon, and how they justify it within their Islamic uh, Islamist ideology. I think what we have so far comes from the reports of uh, those um, terrorists who were captured, and um, and were also already undergoing um, questioning and interrogation by uh, IDF and. Um, uh, at the moment, and also from um, the documents that were found uh, within the possession of the Hamas terrorists who um, who were killed. And uh, these documents and these papers um, actually delineate clear orders for those terrorists. And this was also um, uh, um, confirmed in the interrogation of the of the terrorists, um, saying that they got direct, clear, direct instructions to go for women, to go for children, to be as cruel as they wish and do whatever savagery and cruelty that they can uh, think of, despite despite Islam teachings and they apparently received special dispensation um, from certain imams to allow them to engage in these uh, uh, atrocities. That's, that's what we know from the evidence so far. Yes, thank you. Yes, I just wanna... wanna... Sure, please go on. Just quickly to add that a glossary was found with the words uh, in Hebrew, uh, to all help really uh, command the, the crimes, take uh, your pants off, really um, teaching them how to say these uh, words in Hebrew. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to mention that it's a very rich discussion in the chat questions and, and comments, and I'm hoping that uh, our student organizer uh, can help us save this. Uh, there are a lot of links to organizations uh, that in addition to what you all mentioned that people can uh, advocate with. And there's a timely reminder to go to Washington DC on Tuesday. There'll, there'll be an event of pr uh, protest um, there this, this Tuesday. Before we finish, I, I just wanna make sure if, you know, to give the opportunity to the four of you to each just say a word uh, in closing in any order. Anything that you didn't get to share that you might wish to? I uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll start going back to the reactions of the United Nations uh, bodies that I described briefly before and I talked about the symmetry. So I want to make it clear, I personally do not deny for a moment the sufferings of women and children in Gaza, but 
there is a reason for that, and we can go into the questioning of who exactly is responsible for that. And again, it's it's a it's a subject for another webinar to talk about whether Israel is doing what it must do under international law in order to minimize to the extent possible um, the uh, um, harm to, to um, civilians and to women and children. But it's not a question of symmetry here. You can show empathy and you can also talk about what Israel must do with respect to Palestinians in Gaza, but failing to actually face this event that we Israelis had undergone on October 7th is being complicit in the denial of the most atrocious act in modern humanity. And it is, it is really a shame on these international bodies and international women's organizations. Thank you, Ruth. And, and I think what happens once they don't recognize this is, again, uh, it's actually incitement and more hatred. And, and I want to say um, that uh, I really feel and I want to share that the deep responsibility, um, not just to, to the victims who we really feel uh, we need to respect their memory and, and their stories, but really to future generations. I find myself really thinking about uh, the human rights system, the international system, what it means, what it means for us as human rights advocates for all our, our lives. And uh, I hope um, we'll, we'll bring them um, a new world or think about the ways to, to really change, systematically change um, this entire system in ways that we'll be able to respond to war crimes against women and children and to crimes against humanity that we've seen. In, in uh, words of symmetry, as you said, and no double standard. So talking about humanity, we are in Adassa are taking care of many adolescents from Gaza. Although their authorities is for a long time not paying anymore because we are the enemy. We still get those girls, adolescents, and we don't treat them only for uh, what called um, uh, life-threatening disease like cancer or something. We are performing, for example, fertility preservation procedures, which are not life-threatening at all. They are just well-being. So if talking about humanity, I feel that we are doing very human things for Gaza. And now is the turn of the world to ask Gaza to do some humanity for our hostages, for those adolescents that injured, as I said, pregnant, with broken pelvis, nothing more. Okay, I, I want to tell you something. I, uh, sometimes, you know, when uh, when these kind of things happen in another country to, in the world, you know, when you read the news, you, you imagine like some faraway place and it's none of your business or half or partially your business. I want to tell everybody who is listening right now, Every day in the morning, from the time this horrible pogrom massacre happens, when I wake up in the morning, after two seconds, I suddenly remember where I am. I suddenly remember the atrocities I saw. I, as I told you, for me, I want to see the photographs. I want to see what happened. And I remember the dead bodies, the mutilated bodies. I see them when I go, when I wake up in the morning, and suddenly, I understand that, that I'm living in a new world. I have never thought I would, would face another Holocaust. I call this a Holocaust. I never thought, I'm so happy that both of my parents are not alive. My father just died this year. He was 103 years old. He came and built Israel and so lucky, so lucky that he's not alive and he doesn't see what happened to this country. But to see the world betraying us, to see this liberal, progressive speech without understanding that somebody opened the door of a house entered it in one day it's not just terror it's sadism and i want the people who are listening to understand that this could happen everywhere and if you do not deny it and you don't fight it can happen even to you that's what i have to say thank you all um i'm 
I'm going to turn it over to Cami now, but before I do, you know, Cami was off screen for, for the presentations, but she really made all this happen. She and her fellow student organizers. So thank you very much, Cami, and you can close us out. Thank you so much, Dr. Goffberg, and to all of the students who are working behind the scenes to bring this to light. Thank you all so much for, for your help. So I will be sharing my screen. Perfect. So thank you everyone for joining, to our panelists for sharing such, such important words. Like previously mentioned, a recording will be sent out as quickly as we can to everyone who registered. So we do have your emails. Um, if there's any member of the press, any follow-up questions, please direct them to this email on the screen. You're welcome to write us, and, and as students, we will be directing the questions to the panelists. So thank you, everyone. We will be turning off this call. Hope you all have a good night, good afternoon, wherever you may be.